This is the eighth episode of the Joel Fernandez Show. I'm your host, Joel Fernandez. We've got quite a show lined up for you today. But first, I just wanted to say it finally came in the mail. Well, it was stuck forever at customs, so. But yeah, like I ordered it, I expected it to appear before the solstice. So maybe you would have seen this in one of my videos. But it didn't arrive till a couple days ago. So I was really excited when I got it. Pretty cool. And I'll definitely be using it ceremonially, of course, later on. So, uh, with that out of the way, let's get right into today's card, shall we? Should probably put this away before I do some damage. Today we have the card of the Templars. I told you in this show we're going to get pretty deep. And this card gets even deeper than that. But for those that don't know, the Knights Templar were a group of like religious knights that were dispatched to Jerusalem to reclaim the Temple Mount for the papacy. And what happened was, while they were there, they learned some Gnostic secrets and some secrets of the Temple itself. And actually, from there became a threat to the papacy. And they tell us the rest is history, but we're going to see that it's not always the case. Because the cross of the Knights Templar is actually the same cross of St. George. And you see that on heraldry and insignias the world over. Like, police departments will have it. It's everywhere. And it's not surprising that... The Masonics, the Rosicrucians, the Freemasons, the Illuminati, like all the secret societies and all that stuff also trace their roots back to this group, the Knights Templar, and this knowledge, which is very important as we will see. But what does the card say here? No, they weren't wiped out in 1312. They've been growing in power and wealth and strange knowledge dot 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 meaning that's not everything they're growing in by using this group's action you may force any rival to discard one exposed black card of your choice that's interesting but as you can see in the card he's kneeling on one knee and he's holding the orb and behind him you see the stairs he's he's on the rooftop and the symbology and the flags and everything, they're purple, the gold cross. So that's also very symbolic in terms of colors because it represents the highest chakra and the highest form of knowledge. And what it's talking about here is strange knowledge, which is what made them a threat because they came across the ancient Gnostic wisdom of literally how to change your reality with consciousness. But in March of that 1312, the edict went out and they were to be exterminated. They did it. The last Grand Master, Jacques de Molay. What do they do to our prophets? What kind of examples do they make of these martyrs? But they only stood for some form of truth. But that's what you get when you challenge the institution. And they were burned at the stakes. You know, the confessions were extracted from them like via torture, like Inquisition style torture. We're talking like heavy duty, you know? But they created, even in their own time, they created quite an influence. And one of those influences was Francois Rabelais. And he wrote a book, very interesting book, Gargantuan and Pantagruel, where actually some of those chapters, and the book itself was banned by the church. So. When you read it, it's basically a satire of church and state personified. And it creates this whole kind of epic laced drama where they have this journey and encounter all sorts of things. And in his book, the heroes, very interestingly, they drink heavily as do the Templars. But the Templars didn't drink alcohol. So... Maybe that's an allusion to some other form of intoxication they did, which might also hint to their eradication. Xanadu. Xanadu. Is it a place or does it exist only in virtual reality? 
No one knows. Xanadu is the ultimate vacation spot where all desires are fulfilled. Once one of your servants has visited Xanadu, he'll be loyal forever, just for the chance to go back. If a card duplicating one of your groups is played, it gives no bonus to an attempt to control or destroy your I believe the name Xanadu is like a translation of Chinese. Xanadu. But the idea of a virtual paradise where all desires are fulfilled and once your servants go there, they'll be loyal to you forever. That comes from Hassani Sabah's paradise where he was the founder of the Assassins. And it's speculated that it's because the Templars came in contact with that knowledge that founded the Assassins that they became a threat to the very people that dispatched them. But Marco Polo writes that in order to teleport these people into this virtual reality of paradise, he would intoxicate them with like heavy doses of hashish, where like they would eat it. The effective rate is extremely high when you eat it. And when they would wake up, they were in this place where like the girls were so beautiful and they were doing everything and they had everything there and all kinds of fresh food. Just listen to the account from the travels of Marco Polo himself. The old man was called in their language al -Adin. He had caused a certain valley between two mountains to be enclosed and had turned it into a garden, the largest and most beautiful that ever was seen, filled with every variety of fruit. In it were erected pavilions and palaces, the most elegant that can be imagined, all covered with gilding and exquisite painting. And there were runnels, too, flowing freely with wine and milk and honey and water, and numbers of ladies and of the most beautiful damsels in the world, who could play on all manner of instruments and sung most sweetly, and danced in a manner that is charming to behold. For the old man desired to make his people believe that this was actually paradise, so he fashioned it after the description that Muhammad gave of his paradise, to wit, that it should be a beautiful garden, running with conduits of wine and milk and honey and water, and full of lovely women for the delectation of all its inmates. And sure enough, the Saracens of those parts believed that it was paradise. Now no man was allowed to enter the garden save those whom he intended to be his Ashashin. There was a fortress at the entrance to the garden, strong enough to resist all the world, and there was no other way to get in. He kept at his court a number of the youths of the country, from twelve to twenty years of age, such as had a taste for soldiering, and to these he used to tell tales about paradise, just as Muhammad had been wont to do. And they believed in him, just as the Saracens believe in Muhammad. Then he would introduce them into his garden, some four or six or ten at a time, having first made them drink a certain potion which cast them into a deep sleep, and then causing them to be lifted and carried in. So when they awoke, they found themselves in the garden. When therefore they awoke and found themselves in a place so charming, they deemed that it was paradise in very truth, and the ladies and damsels dallied with them to their heart's content, so that they had what young men would have, and with their own good, well, they never would have quitted the place. Now this prince, whom we call the old one, kept his court in grand and noble style, and made those simple hill folks about him believe firmly that he was a great prophet. And when he wanted one of his Ashashin to send on any mission, he would cause that potion whereof I spoke to be given to one of the youths in the garden, and then had him carried into his palace. So when the young man awoke, he found himself in the castle, and no longer in that paradise, whereat he was not over well pleased. He was then conducted to the old man's presence, and bowed before him with great veneration, as believing himself to be in the presence of a true prophet. The prince would then ask whence he came, and he would reply that he came from paradise, and that it was exactly such as Muhammad had described it in the law. This, of course, gave the others who stood by and who had not been admitted the greatest desire to enter therein. 
So when the old man would have any prince slain, he would say to such a youth, Go thou and slay so and so. And when thou returnest, my angels shall bear thee into paradise. And shouldst thou die, nonetheless, even so will I send my angels to carry thee back into paradise. So he caused them to believe, and thus there was no order of his that they would not affront any peril to execute, for that great desire they had to get back into that paradise of his. And in this manner, the old one got his people to murder any one whom he desired to get rid of. Thus, too, the great dread of he inspired all princes withal, made them become his tributaries in order that he might abide at peace and amity with them. It's a very interesting thing to consider because it says that no matter what Hassani Sabah commanded them to do, they would do it. And there's even one incident where a guy was with him and in order to prove how loyal his subjects were, he just pointed like they were outside the wall. He pointed to the top of the wall and he motioned for the guy. The guy just jumped to his death just to prove his loyalty to him because these guys had visited this realm. It's the same way that the early Gnostics were able to face the lions and say, straight to the face of Caesar, we will really have fun with you from the other side. And it scared them. It scared them shitless. And that's why Rome still was afraid of this knowledge. They still had to stamp it out. They stamped it out in Alexandria, and they're stamping it out till today. But they can't put out the fire. It's blazing no matter what, and it's going to continue to spread. You can't hide it. Because not only did they have their time, but this age has been redeemed, and you will see this knowledge spread uncontrollably. It has to. It has to if we're moving into a new era. But they have been depicted in exchange of goods and wares with the assassins, and even in images like this where they're shown playing chess, which is symbolic of an exchange of knowledge. They're doing more than playing chess. Like for the situation of them to play chess to occur has to have all this other stuff happen. You know, you don't just meet someone on the road and say, hey, you want to play a game of chess? I don't know. Some of you guys might. No judgment there. But man, they were all rounded up. They were destroyed. They were made examples of. Like I said, Rome is so petrified that other people will follow. Even if other people know the knowledge, they want you to shut up and keep his secrets. They make examples of people. They make martyrs out of them. And really then people look into it and they realize the magnitude of the subject at hand. But you can't kill fire. And there's a rumor that they escaped and they continue to this day, not just in the secret societies, but the actual Templars themselves. But I won't be able to cover that in this episode. But I will keep a promise I made in an earlier episode where I said I'd talk about the pharaohs. Specifically, the priesthood of Amun, the corrupt priesthood of Amun, which went off during the invasion by the Roman Empire, basically. And they went and moved to Switzerland in the Alps. And we're not actually going to talk about Switzerland, but we're going to talk about who's hiding out there in the Alps. Specifically, the gnomes of Zurich. And the reason this is a special card is because this is one of the teams you can play under. So this is basically one of the groups of what, I guess is playing the game. There's one group that is the Illuminati. And this is another group that's on par with them. And technically these are the bankers that are hiding out in their Swiss vaults. Which are basically hollowed out mountains. But there's guys, there's these watchmakers and the gnomes of Zurich. And gnomes basically like mine stuff underground. And they run from the sunlight because they're slimy creepers. But banksters aside, they were literally originally the Sir DC. Which is how we get the word Switzerland, which literally means in French, the Sisters of Isis. It's the Amun priesthood, the corrupt Amun priesthood, I should say. But by then it had all been corrupted. Bacru corrupted. Because everybody had forgotten their true source, which is actually this connection we have in the I amness of being. But people forget that and they get caught up with other things. It's understandable because we're physical beings, but we got to keep coming back. We got to keep coming back and raising. And that's the point. 
that's the point of what's going on here because we're really creating a new world where we're raising and we're making it happen through the power of our own awareness. Not by any kind of crazy institution that sets it up for us. And that's what we have to say no to. Things like this. And I'm not criticizing the, any race of people. I'm not saying I'm saying that there is a group that is operating behind a veil that makes it very easy for them to get away with anything. We gotta say no to institutions. We gotta say no to people that set themselves up. Like these guys. Beware the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and yet are not. An ancient and subtle brotherhood. The elders know well the art of conspiracy. They can reorganize your entire power structure. This must take place on your turn and requires their action and an action from your Illuminati. Read the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. Read them and see if they're not coming to pass. See if you agree with them. Why do they even exist in the first place? What is up with this? This is as freaky as the Georgia Guidestones, I gotta say. But the time is ripe and we have redeemed this age because we have raised our own awareness. And that is what they are afraid of. Because that leads to the next step when all this knowledge is just going to flood in. It's just going to flood in. And we are going to see an influx of not only freedom, not only expansion and abundance, but we are just going to see everything just explode into like what we would consider a utopia. Maybe it could still use some work, but we are going to see everything just take off like we've never seen it before. And the good thing is, it's not that long. We have a waiting period. There is a birthing process to this whole thing, but it's not that long. And now we're just at the cusp of it. So we just got to stay still. And by this summer, we won't even recognize the world that we find ourselves in. And that's a good thing because the guys like these to whom we owe colonialism to, we owe the Inquisition to, I'm talking about the scum that are the Jesuits. Don't attempt to adjust your TV set. It won't help anyway. We have control over the vertical. We have control of the horizontal. But the question is, who has control? For you. This is probably the craziest thing ever. It's like, yeah, there's crazy things happening. Like, we haven't seen warfare on this level ever before. Like, we've seen military warfare. We've seen information warfare. But this is all kinds of multi-strategy warfare outside of the normal type. But let me tell you, there is the normal type going on. And that's kind of why... They've implemented the rules is because to keep people safe. I don't know how, but there's crazy stuff happening on domestic soil. So we got to stay patient because I know for a fact that things are turning and big things are changing. And the fact is, it might look worse. The thing is that it has to get a little bit worse for the whole circle to be complete and the big final unveiling to just knock this whole thing out of the park and that's what i've seen that's what's happening and i'm seeing it happen which is crazy it's like this is literally the craziest best intense time to be alive and we're doing it because we're here we're capable of actually propelling this era forward and being the fulfilled people in the future that this era is actually bringing into fruition. So we have the capacity of being those ripe fruits, so to speak. I don't like that analogy, but it's just going to have to do. Ripe fruits. Anyway, March on Washington, and we see very interestingly in the card, the Capitol. What's even funnier are the videos showing the shuttle buses to which Antifa was escorted in the back and the front by police. What's funny is that the police are letting people in. 
What's funny is that right in front of the person breaching the security guard is a photographer to capture the whole thing in between the security guard and the breacher. Boom! What's going on? And the people aren't too happy. And that's why they're freaking out. And that's why the censorship is increasing. And that's what's going on. And I don't know what the future of this show is going to be. I don't even know what the future of this channel is going to be. But what's going on has to continue. The truth has to come out. And some way or another, this momentum is just propelling us forward. But people aren't happy. And it unfortunately, they're not letting go as easily as even I thought it would be. But I know, like, there's going to be a fight. The evil doesn't want to give up ever. But what's going to be lost if they lose now? It happened four years ago, and it totally threw off their timeline. This is a parallel timeline, which has totally been redeemed. And it it can only continue a certain way. But the momentum is so that it has to be broken away from the old. It has to, like, break the sound barrier. Let's call it, like, the vibrational barrier. So, literally, I know it sounds crazy, but we're literally going to shed a whole lot of not only systems and not only, like, paradigms, but because we're going to shed those paradigms, we're actually going to shed whole spheres of our emotional realms like fear or narcissism these things will totally wither away from our experience it might not happen overnight but it's going to accelerate and it's going to be purged very quickly people are just going to be able to see right through it and it won't be able to exist like they'll literally be by themselves if they want to continue that way you know some people are really bad liars and you just see right through it it's going to be like everybody you're just going to be able to read them through there you go transparent i okay. see your intentions i see your intentions i see your intestines and your intentions what i have for dinner last night cake it's just a different awareness but it's like the more awareness you have the more it flows and the more it just creates more of an awareness more of an experience but they're going to proclaim themselves kings. They have to. It's in the script. The evil is so greedy for a victory. They have to declare that victory premature. Father's failing fast. I will be king now. Call together the royal officials and all of my brothers. Except my half-brother Solomon. Why, sir? Do you intend to? Mm-hmm. Rally my supporters and declare myself the king. I shall reign in father's stead. Yeah! Unbeknownst to his father, Adonijah gathered a following with the help of Joab and Abiathar the priest. He killed sheep and cattle and fat oxen and prepared a great feast at Enrogo. He called his men and his brothers to the feast to celebrate in his honor, but Solomon was not invited. <laughs> about it the prince is holding a feast at enrogel right now sir he is mm. where he is being hailed as the king my lord did you tell adonijah that he should replace you without disclosing it to your son solomon or myself if not you'd better do something about it at once please come here yes do as i say Please take Solomon and go down to Gion. Be sure he rides on my own mule. You and the priest anoint his head as the new king. Bless you, sir. Ah, then let the trumpets be blown and cry, God save King Solomon. Yes, your majesty. Amen.
that celebration for? What's that they're bellowing? They're cheering for King Solomon, sir. What? Sir, fire takes the sun. Adonijah, King David has just declared Solomon to be the new king. No, I don't believe it. The whole town's rejoicing at the news, so that's what the uproar is you've been hearing. And that is the crime completed. Like, that's the crime worthy. I mean, worthy of the punishment that's coming to them. And I'm not criticizing. Like, this is not a channel to incite violence. This is a channel of love and how to create utopia. So let's not get stuck up on this subject. But what happened has to be shed by the collective in order for us to move forward into a new way of doing things in a new timeline. But at the height of their celebration, when this stone is revealed, and like Goliath, this whole giant will fall down. He won! He killed him dead! No, he can beat the Philistines now. Let's attack! We've lost Goliath! Run! And didn't Sidney Powell say it would be biblical? It will be biblical. So I wouldn't be surprised if they know something that the rest of us might not know, but that we're going to see a production and a half. Like, they knew about it all along. They knew about the mail-in ballots, they knew about the machines, and those are not even the best cards in their deck. you got to realize. The thing is, we'd even heard that the military would be called out way back before because they're not going to give up that easy. You know what? This show talks about it, and this show is in the 80s, but the time period that the show was set in is actually the late 1800s. I wonder if they were doing this all the way back then. I'm not going to cheat. All right. Well, let's call it, say, uh, absentee voting. Absentee voting? Mm hmm We could just have some of the folks who aren't around cast their votes for you. What folks would you be talking about? Well, I happen to have the records of all the registered voters in Dry Gulch, both living and dead. And I thought we could take the folks who've deceased over the last 15 or 20 years, and they could cast their votes for you. You're saying that... I should win this election by using the votes of dead people? Sheriff, if they were here, they'd want to vote for you. Tutwater, I can't do that. Sheriff, we know that Luther Bedlow is cheating, and if you're going to win, you're just going to have to do a little cheating of your own. It's all right. Two wrongs don't make a right, Tutwater. I can't cheat even if Luther Bedlow is. I'd sooner lose this election. Sheriff. Sheriff, if you don't use this plan, you don't have a, a prayer of winning. <sighs> Listen, if you change your mind, would you come and get me, please? <sighs> That's something to think about. It's really something to think about. You never know how deep this stuff really goes, but it's starting to be peeled back. The veil is starting to be lifted. So I'm sure a lot of people are in for... I, th I think everybody's in for a few surprises over the next little while. It's a good thing. It's a good thing because when change happens, we always move forward. That's the point of moving forward. Change. So paradoxical. And people want change, but then when they have change, it's like, I didn't want that to change, man. Time is speeding up. There's an esoteric reason for this, but I won't cover that here. It just has to do with the bringing in of like this 
Christ consciousness messianic age and literally an age where the world is just experiencing miracles after miracles what we would call miracles but by then is just going to be it's like you know the ancients would call some of the things we would call some of the things the ancients did miracles let's say that mind you there's a lot going on that we don't know about but the time is speeding up because the time is changing because it already has to process the old and it's ushering the new. We're already seeing a lot of new having started even decades ago. But it's begun a change that's only accelerated. And now it's reached a crossing point. So what we saw before was actually the point before the pivot. Everything before what I think 2012. But now we're actually in the ninth year after the pivot. And pff, wow. Wow is all I can say. When I had this information come through and I was like, oh, the year in 2012. And yeah, the year has to be based on constellations, not these months that are totally off center. And oh, what, the signs start on the 20th of every month? What is that? And now the 21st, <laughs> like there's no consistency. And when there's consistency, then you're actually reading the book. So that's why the year is so important because it's a symbol of time and it's literally the symbol of everything. The universe is a fractal of this one thing. Everything is just holographically projected and it all contains this cycle within it. It's amazing. It's a pulse. It's the torus. It's the sine wave. It's just the form that energy flows in. And it's, it's beautiful because it's all things. It's all things, and it's complex, yet it's simple. But this information, the information itself will only accelerate. So I'm not worried about the information. As long as I'm here, I'm still going to be showing this and funneling this awareness out because that's the trajectory of the new era. That's the way things have to unfold because we have to realize more of who we are and then we have to live as more of who we are. As we do that, we create more of the world that we know we deserve. Everybody starts to work together in that world because everybody's doing more of what they want to do. Have you ever wondered what it would be like if there was no sun? left in the world at all no one could see everyone would be lost nobody could find their way help i can't see i'm afraid of the dark who turned out the light i'm lost god is light if you know him then let his light that is inside you shine you may wonder what difference one little light can make. But remember, even the tiniest little light is stronger than all the darkness. So, shine. Because as long as there is light left shining, people will see it and find their way back to God. It's a world where the entire consciousness will raise not just ours, and we're going to see changes in the behavior of animals. We're going to see the ecosystem change, weather patterns change, but for the better, and that make us thrive. We're looking at the world and we wonder, huh, 80% of the world is deadly, but that's because 80% of our mind is dormant it's just on autopilot and it's running subconscious patterns that a lot of people don't even want to look at and that's where manifesting and self-awareness and doing the inner work comes in anytime an emotion comes up anytime a problem comes up you address the emotion and you, if you have to make things right in the physical yeah go do that because technically if you're experiencing a physical experience you did some form of manifestation in order to get there in the first place so yeah you do have to kind of make it right but from there you can manifest a much better space 
and just keep raising that awareness, raising that vision of yourself because there's a reason why your vision of yourself has potential to grow. It's because that is in you in order to fulfill so that you can be more of that. That is part of you. That is actually who you're here to be. And that's fun, stepping into it, because it's you. If you're stepping into someone else and comparing yourself to someone else, that's when people have a hard time. But when you be more of yourself, there's no work involved. 12 hours of editing, bah! But the time is changing, and the veil is being lifted, and that's why it's coming off. It's coming off. The... When it does, it's going to coincide with a huge unveiling. It's symbolic. It's all a manifestation. And the very fact that the whole world kind of fell under this spell and that everybody has to wear a marjoram, it's implemented like that. The very fact that it's happening means it's symbolic. And we will see it unfold in the most dramatic way. I'm excited for it. Things are really crazy. This is a really crazy time. I could keep going on. But speaking of signs, it's very interesting because I pay attention, but I never put any emphasis in looking for signs because I'm always like looking in here for the true answer, right? And that way you don't have to worry about the signs because sometimes you get a sign or sometimes you can interpret a sign differently. Sometimes the signs are complicated and they're overwhelming, right? I mentioned in one of my previous videos, actually I made a video about it when I got a flat tire. That was quite an episode, but it taught me, actually it taught me many things. It took a while for the right tires to come in because of... Like all the border issues and it's it was weird because like the car I have, for one thing, it's not your regular car. And then on top of that, I I need special tires because that's just how I roll. I do talk on this channel about the messianic age, and a lot of people don't get that. And they're like, Oh yeah, five D or you know, even Christ consciousness, but I'm like it's all part of the same thing. And if we understand it Kabbalistically and in the actual deep understanding of what the scripture means, it's like you can actually crack the universe. And it's literally a manual of cracking the universe and manifesting reality. That's what it is. But it's a method of, uh, I don't know how to describe this in just like a couple sentences, but it's a method of like raising your consciousness through a series of states. And those states are personified as people. And I'm not saying that that's not a fractal that historically happened. I'm not saying it is. I mean, I do say that the universe is a fractal. So it's possible that a lot of it is fractalized in a way that we're interpreting historically. Maybe we don't know. Maybe it is historic. But anyway, I digress. I went to get the tires changed and the guy that did my service was named Elijah. And I thought that's really weird because looking for the Messianic age, there's a Jewish tradition on Passover where you go to the door, like the youngest child will go to the door and traditionally he'll look for Eliyahu, Elijah. But when I saw his name, I'm like, oh, that's a real sign because the whole story of like, what he did, maybe I'll make a video of this actually, what he did is actually parallel to what's going on and the purge of the swamp that we're seeing. And that's why they're so paranoid with only like now it's only 10 days left and they're so paranoid they want to impeach. Why would you want to impeach somebody when there's only 10 days unless you're scared of something they're going to do in those 10 days? Good evening and welcome to Term Limits. Don't look at my eye. Tonight we speak to an 80-year-old woman. Ladies and gentlemen, the house drinker. <laughs> What's it like to be house drinker? You know, mom always says that your life is like a bottle of vodka. You just never know how much you're gonna drink. <laughs> Walk me through one of your days as drinker of the house. Well, I like to follow the Democratic playbook. Democratic playbook? Yes, um, the uh, Democratic playbook. You know, it's like, um, I deny there's a problem, and uh, the press supports me. <laughs> what? 
You know, I refer to everything um, as peaceful and um, calm. And um, I make sure to go on camera and praise the criminals, and uh, the press praises me. <laughs> That's your playbook? Yes, and, um, you know, if, if all else fails, and uh, I just can't keep any order, um, I just blame Trump. You blame it on Trump? Yes. I cannot emphasize this enough, all right? Always blame Trump, all right? It always works, all the time. Anytime there's a problem, you always blame Trump. Well, House Drinker, realistically, is a second impeachment a smart idea? Don't you take that show with me, young lady. He, he only has a few days left. Isn't this just going to be more taxpayer money wasted? Listen to me, OK? I don't care about taxpayers, all right? When I impeach Trump for the second time, he will never, and I mean never, be able to run for president again. That man is in the strike. We're going to eliminate the Republican and conservative parties forever. Forever? Forever! Can you tell me what happened in your office? Well, these uh, deranged, unhinged, and some um, dangerous Trump supporters, they took my laptop and then they took a poop on my desk. They took a poop on your desk? Yeah, they took a poop on my desk. On my gosh, Sam desk. That's terrible. Yeah, well, first they spray painted my garage and peed on my point desk. And now they're stealing my laptops and crapping on my desk. <laughs> so it makes a lot of sense that they're running scared because this stone is going to be like Goliath. We're going to see this giant come crashing down and beheaded. What's your take, Daryl? Joel, you know, there's a lot of trouble going on. I don't know who you're listening to. I don't know where you're getting this information from, but you are misled, my friend. You are living in an echo chamber. Like, you're just getting validated by everybody like you. You have no clue of reality. You have any idea what went down at the Capitol? No, you don't, because you weren't there. Huh, I'm so tired of people telling me what to do and just being locked up and all this nonsense that's going on. You gotta face reality, man. Turn on CNN or watch the news. You know, you like it's like you don't want to know. Well, Daryl, it's not like I haven't checked out the other side. I've checked out the other side. And let me tell you, it's painful. Like, if you watch both sides, if you really listen to what he, the man has to say, uh, anyway... I'm not even going to argue and take that marjoram off because you're going to get a rash. Frankly, I know the time is short and I'm not so worried about it because honestly, I've found a voice here and it doesn't seem to matter. And in doing that and in having raised my vibration and my conscious expression into a new mode of reality, that that is actually the key to unlocking and pulling back that veil and bypassing that kind of barrier of physical reality of wearing a marjoram in public so yeah the whole unveiling of that and people are going to come into more of their own expression it is symbolic of course physically this is going on because it's a ploy to keep the native population silenced while there's a foreign country on domestic soil there is seriously domestic battles going on that we have no idea about because the majority of us can't even leave the house for what we don't really need so what's the point right and in the meantime like you hear helicopters like you hear heavy aircraft you hear like the ground literally vibrates from the machinery that they're moving in the city in the suburbs like, since when did they move this kind of machinery in the suburbs? And they're digging the whole thing up and putting these wires in. They're putting, like, optic cables? I don't mean to complain. There's a lot to complain about. And it's easy. I'm not blaming people for getting distraught because the bad news is all around you and they're pummeling people with it. But it's very important for us to raise to a level of unconditionality. And that just means that we're not swayed by the conditions that we have a vision of awareness in our mind and that propels us forward that's what unconditionality means that's what agape means agape means it's described as unconditional love and that love is the source energy that's flowing and connecting all things together and that's what's described in scripture but the actual agape encompasses an unconditional way of looking at things and then interacting with it. That unconditionality is the fundamental catalyst. It's actually the 
fastest, strongest magnet that you can use to attract a manifestation to you. It even says the greatest of these is agape, out of the faith, hope, and agape. And faith is such a powerful force, just enough. The belief in something and holding a vision, that's what it is. But in faith, of course, you're still dealing with the outside world, right? Hope is literally the anchor that you use to hold on to that vision. But the agape is when you can look at the outside world and see it through the lens of Christ consciousness. So you see things not as they are, but as... Like literally God sees their fullest created potential and that's how you interact with it. And by doing so, you create a reality bubble that literally will create ripples out and will create that reality more and more. As events unfold, as sequences unfold down that timeline, and there's bubbles of timelines. People are living in different bubbles, experiencing different things, and that's why certain people will fall victim to a certain crime, because they're living coupled in a bubble. And it's it gets really complicated and really interesting when you're dealing with all these different manifestations and how they interact. Remember, each and every one of you are your own bubbles regardless of the bigger bubble. You all move at your own rate, your own pace. It's up to you to determine what that pace is by the choices that you make. And that's all you need to focus on. Please remember, just by living your life, you act as a living example so that others can see and can choose if they so desire to match your frequency. And so in that sense, you are sharing it with others just by being yourself because you become, oh, how shall we put it, infectious. Your vibration radiates. Your heart has intelligence and that it actually communicates to every other heart. Literally, electromagnetically. All your hearts right now are talking to one another. Literally. I am not making this up. It is not just a philosophical idea or a euphemism or a metaphor. Your hearts are talking to each other in electromagnetic pulses right now. You are sitting in each other, immersed in each other's expanding heart bubbles every listen to this think about this picture this give energy to this and you will see what kind of impact you have all the time every single beat of your heart sends out an electromagnetic 360 degree spherical bubble at the speed of light that electromagnetic pulse 186,300 miles per second That means instantly, nearly, every single one of those bubbles pulsates around and through the entire planet from every single being on it. You are immersed in each other's heartbeats. When you begin to talk to your own heart, you will know how to talk to others, sometimes without saying a thing, with your mouth or your brain, which sometimes is for the best. No offense. But like a magnet, we're just pulled to what we're emitting. And justice is always served. You cannot escape it. What you put out is what you get back. No matter what, you're going to reap what you sow.
It's very important to just be earnest and really see the energy you're using to emit a desire because you might be emitting it because you really want something else or you're feeling inadequate or there's some form of like a negative difference of potential. And you want to avoid that because that will only create negative events down the road that have to complete that equation. Something to think about. Something to really think about as we move forward because we really want to create a world that matches who we're here to be and not a lot of the programming that has been shoved down our throats just for all our lives, basically. Imagine it, 12 plus years of being indoctrinated with a left brain curriculum. Why don't we start to shift and incorporate more of right hemisphere paradigms into our curriculum? Of course, the education system has to change. And that's going to be coming here on this channel too. So stay tuned for more videos like that. I'll see you next time on the Joel Fernandez Show. Agape. Salam. Namaste. so to speak.